Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and medium, and here we explore life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. Michelle Little is joining us on the show today. Michelle is a certified death midwife who helps us prepare for the end of this life at Beautiful Dying Company. Conducting monthly workshops online called Exit Papers 101, Michelle holds our hands as she helps prepare the essential final paperwork for the dying and the death. The medical directives, the family tree, the final wishes, funeral arrangements, the memorials, and everything else. Michelle arrives at this calling, the consummation of her history as a peacemaker and life transformationalist, from leading women's empowerment circles to shamanic drumming in Ireland, from directing corporate project management to supporting and honoring first responders and children worldwide. When Michelle talks, things happen. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much for inviting me onto your podcast today. So we're all in for a really special treat right now. And I want you just to start by sharing a poem that you just shared with me moments before getting on. And I felt like it would be a perfect way to start this podcast. Thank you. So um, this poem is uh, on behalf of the men from Rescue One, Midtown Manhattan, and uh, the loss of my brother and 11 of his brothers on September 11th, 2001. The men from Rescue One. My heart was full of sorrow, like a circle round the sun, in memory of my brother and the men from Rescue One. My candle burned in silence in thoughts of yesterday, the love inside my brother's heart, the way we laughed and played. One picture perfect morning as terror filled the sky, he rushed into the fires of hell to save somebody's life. Eleven fallen heroes who got the final call as I turned on my TV set to watch the towers fall. On the tree-lined streets of Brooklyn, the people stood and stared with photographs and flowers in the echo of despair, suspended in their disbelief at the evil that men do, the enemy that hides behind the eyes of me and you. The engine crushed in silence, chrome and crimson draped in black, remembering that tearful day America was attacked. Bagpipes play a solemn tune, and the people all salute a slow parade of fire trucks and brothers dressed in blue. I pray to God in heaven that heroes never die. Someone brave must lead the way so others may survive. My heart is proud and thankful, like the warm rays of the sun, in memory of my brother and the men from Rescue One. So that would be for FDNY firefighter David M. Weiss. Can you tell us your brother's story? So um, my brother, my brother was um, an amazing guy. He was, it's, what's interesting is that I've always said he is because he'll always be my brother. So he's not a was for me, but he's an is. And, uh, and even though his body isn't here, which I miss desperately and his voice and his sarcasm, the whole essence of, of him being here is really important. And so um, he, he's a father of two beautiful children. He was um, divorced for quite a while uh, before 9-11. He actually found his love of his life prior to just a couple of years before or just within that year. Anyway, he was fall, he fell in love with Kathy. He was moving in with her and his and her children who are the same age as his children and everything was going beautifully well. He had a little bit of a shoulder injury and then went back to work on September 10th. And so on September 11th, he was, you know, he had his schedule, which we have a picture of the whole schedule that he actually, it's his handwriting at the, at the, um, at his, uh, fire at his firehouse and um he they just as soon as the call came they rushed into the fires of hell and um they didn't know what was going to happen they didn't know what was going on they only heard that there was an airplane that hit the north tower and that's the tower with the restaurant on it It is also the all the antennas for both buildings the tall buildings uh 
the North Tower and the South Tower. Mm -hmm. And um, and so he, there are um, prior to 9-11, he was in a um, a TV show called The Bravest that uh, was going to be aired in September and uh, which they did, but we didn't know it at the time. And so his, his picture and who he is on this on these two different uh, episodes is him talking about how, you know, He's uh, always known that he was going to be a firefighter from the age of 12. He was always in firehouses and always doing all these wonderful things. And he. No, uh, that's OK. You were just saying he was he he was on this show and he always knew that so, this was going to was going to that he, this was what he was going to be doing. And so he shares that on the on the bravest TV show. And he also shares that, uh, you know, you always have to tell your children and your wife uh, that this, you may not see me again. You know, this, mm. this work is that tough and, and you may or may not. And to always tell your children and your, and your loved ones that you love them because you never know if you're going to come home. And, uh, you know, being in New York is already dangerous for firefighters. And, but what happened with David is he saved a man's life while he was off duty and uh, scaffolded down 60 feet off the FDR, FDR drive and saved this man's body out of uh, his car. So he was in the New York Post's parking lot in reverse to just, you know, reverse and move out. And he had a heart attack at that moment. And he just reversed right off of the parking lot into the river. And so my brother jumped into the river and got this man out who happened to be the brother of the owner of the New York Post. And um, wow. and and pulled him to the side to have other people help bring this body up. He unfortunately did die, uh, and David did get hypothermia, and he was in the hospital for a while. But uh, this uh, brought him to rescue one. Um, so he was very. I think I'm going off a bit too much no, here. No, no. I I mean, people's lives and stories are fascinating, and that he deserve. I mean, he clearly was a hero. Yeah. And deserves his story told. And and if he were here, he would say, I'm not a hero. I'm doing my job. Uh, the last time that we see him on 9-11, which we do get to see him. I mean, most people weren't able to get that glimpse of, of their loved ones. Uh, at the. Uh, but there was a, um, a documentary that was being done prior to September 11th from these two French brothers um, I forgot their names. Forgive me, please. And they um, they were documenting a rookie, um, as we you know, the beginning and where they end. And what happened was September 11th came in in the middle of all of that. They were at the World Trade Center, the North Tower, documenting everybody on their on the on their video. And you see David walking back and forth in front of an elevator and he says give me something to work with here and that's the mm -hmm. last time that we hear him his voice and that's the last time we see him so people you know some of firefighters said oh I've, i saw him on the 30th floor some say i saw him on the 70th floor but we never did find him his body was totally gone mm -hmm. and he was in the north tower you said he was in Which the was tower. the second tower that fell, right? Right. It was the first tower hit, second tower that that was, I don't know, about falling. Um, so I've got lots of questions still about 9-11, and we all do, and it's not even conspiracy theories anymore. And, you know, we just want to give our, our loved ones their their peace and their and be able to grieve. I mean, we we haven't. There hasn't been a chance for any of us, whether we're a family member or, you know, uh, an America, it doesn't matter, around the world, uh, haven't had a chance to even grieve through all of that. Now we've got COVID-19 and, you know, another, another essence of, you know, isolation big time. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel like there hasn't been a real opportunity to grieve after that? I mean, it's been 19 years, 20 years, right? Yep. Yeah, because there there are unanswered questions. There are mm -hmm. there are situations that occur that um, 
have not been talked about and the media doesn't cover it. And, um, you know, you have to have these uh, investigative reporters who are willing to step out there to share information. I mean, I used to speak on behalf of our, our rescue workers who are dying today. Mm -hmm. I've been doing, I've been speaking out since 2001. I did put on a uh, barbecue for the firefighters on August 11th, 2002, just 11 months after. And that all came through me. You know, I didn't know how to do any of this. I'm in, I'm in San Diego in my little office and I was told I got to put on uh, a barbecue in New York city. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just followed whatever that is. It's for me, it's like frequency and vibration that comes through me like a maze. And uh, so if I'm going in the right direction, then I'm, I'm going to get to the finish line. <laughs> and, um, and so I have these, uh, I did a beautiful, it happened. It was amazing. There were over 600 families that came to the uh, barbecue. I received over $210,000 worth of in-kind donations from the barbecues itself, from Weber Grills to uh, all the food to the venue itself everything everything that we needed just came through um and there was it wasn't anybody that said no do you feel or how has your brother shown up for you since he is no longer in a physical body like how do you feel him uh, it's a vibration it's a vibration kind of frequency thing and it may not just be david you know i think that there's a lot of energies that kind of cluster you know for events like this for you know, the Beautiful Dying Expo, I mean, everything, everything that we're doing at this expo is really sharing about what is needed now and not wait till the end. It's too late. So tell us about, because one of the things I think that is always so incredible, and I think really sort of dictates the outcome of how you, how you do when you experience a real traumatic loss, any loss, frankly, but I think that losses that are out of order, um, when I say out of order, meaning someone dies younger than we normally expect them to, you know, losses of children, siblings, spouses early on, you know, those losses that can be sudden losses, so traumatic, and we, we can't, sometimes we never really fully process them at all. That doesn't, I'm not saying finish grieving them, because we never finish grieving, but really working through and processing that loss. Some people end up never, ever, they go into a deep, dark hole of depression, and other people don't you've managed not to, um, and you've really made meaning. Can you tell us about how you've done that? Thank you, Amy. That was really kind. Um, so when 9-11 when happened, we all saw, we all think we saw the second tower fall. We all, you know, it was over and over and over again playing, playing it. So when, when you heard it from someone else to go online, to go on TV and see what's going on, you will see the same coverage over and over and over again. Every 30 seconds, it was the same c collapse. And so we all think we saw it happening in real time. It, it probably did not. So that's, that's something that I really wanted to share. And when this was all going on, it, it was like uh, I had two onions in my hand. One of them was dark and one of them was light. And the dark, it's easy for many of us to go into the dark than into the light. It's just so much easier to just like go in and just dribble into layer after layer after layer. I, I never went that way. I had a choice. There was a choice. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do here, Michelle? Your brother's mm -hmm. gone. You know, everybody keeps saying that we could probably find him. Let's get to New York. Let's figure it out. And, um, but this light it was like okay, I, I, I'm I'm choosing I'm choosing the light. And in the light, the layers of light was about peace, it was about compassion, it was about love and understanding and giving people a chance. And um and so through that, um I had started an organization already called the Youth Alliance when 9-11 happened. And the Youth Alliance was um a an umbrella of 14 different organizations helping our children in any, in any type of uh, 
wherever they are, wherever they were at that time, and take them to a place where they could be connected, whether it was uh, teen suicide prevention, uh, pregnancy prevention, sharing with children, what, what, wherever they were at. So these, these particular um, organizations that came together, um, I, was, I had just put all the contracts and the agreements together, and we were just about to send out uh, a corporate sponsorship for Unite in, uh, for the Youth Alliance when 9-11 happened. And I went into a whole whirlwind of like, oh, my God, what's next? And so um, on September 16th, which was a Sunday, I was um, put onto this huge worldwide teleconferencing call. And they asked what I needed. And I said I needed to be in New York with my children and who were in third and fifth grade at the time. While, while this was all going on, on that Sunday before we left on that journey, I had this vibrational frequency thing that happened and said, I have to unite in peace. What do I do with that? And so, the, so it's about um, sharing my brother so I started an organization called Unite in Peace, took everything I was doing from the Youth Alliance and kind of put that aside saying, do you, you know, let's move forward. If, if you have follow up program for these children, you know, getting them all gung ho and getting them through all of this information, do we have a follow up program to help them be mentors to others? And so um, two out of the 14 said, yes, they had. And then, and then this Unite in Peace came through and said, I have to I have to take this to a next level to share with children that they have a voice and to speak out how they feel about the world through peace projects starting in our local communities and sharing them on a global level uh, of being a service to all like my brother was. So mm -hmm. everything about United Peace was all about who he was uh, in the world and how he uh, interacted with kids. I mean, he was amazing and funny and, and then, you know, bamming them with information that they will need for the rest of their lives. And so, so Unite in Peace came through. We had a beautiful um, few years with that. I had a, a program called Pinwheels of Peace, which kids would write their messages of peace on pinwheel paper, and then they would build their pinwheels, and they place them onto their schoolyards on September 21st, which is the International Day of Peace. And they would put out these beautiful formations of peace signs or whatever with their peace piece pinwheels and then they mailed them to me and I shipped them out to kids in the midst of adversity and refugee mm. camps and orphanages in Africa and the Middle East. So I did that all the way up till about 2011 and then I kind of stopped. Um, too much information going out there, uh, not enough information being heard, especially with our firefighters and rescue workers and even the people that were told to go back to work are all ill and we we're going to hear more and more about that as we move forward. People are mm -hmm. dying of respiratory problems, mm -hmm. uh, cancers, leukemia, and um, and now on top of that, we been, have COVID-19. Right. And this has been John Stewart, who I have a giant crush on. I love him. I do too. It's he's, he's This has been his mission. Well, really. he got involved it's, with it's, John Feel, the Feel Good Foundation to help uh, recognize what needs to be done and the money that needs to be presented to the families and, and to, and if that person is still alive uh, mm -hmm. to give them the resources they need, but they didn't give, they didn't take care of our, I'm going to call them heroes um, from day one. They waited, mm -hmm. they waited a long time to get all the data in first before they went out to help. Mm -hmm. and, and, and relieve these individuals of the pain and suffering that they're going through. I mean, we're talking about guys like my brother can, you know, scaffold down 60 feet or whatever it was into the river. You have guys that, you know, traveled all the way up to the 70th floor or higher to, to save people. Just complete like disregard for what they did. It seems like, like yeah. that there was no, real recognition sort of not dissimilar from what we're experiencing now for those the people who were you know sort of front and center fighting these these yeah, battles getting, you know the virus so, on the front lines before we know enough to really protect or we're not going to get political here but before we did enough to really protect, not know enough. Right. Um, and John, yeah. I mean, John Feel and John Stewart have done amazing work in bringing 
uh, all, all the information and what what's needed for these these men and women um, who served and and took care of us. Um, so tell us what is your new project, um, your new passion. So the beautiful dying expo. Yeah. So what happened was. Um, you know, through through these last 19 years, or really my entire life, I mean, I've always been able to recognize or feel when someone's about to die. Um, the the quick losses, like a suicide, mm-hmm. um, a heart attack that came on out of nowhere, and those are the people that kind of it's not people, but they're the vibration, their essence shows up for me. Mm-hmm. The only person I ever really saw was my grandfather when he. Um, he came to me and told me that he he's come to say goodbye. He promised he would always say goodbye when he when he wouldn't be on this earth any longer. And so when I was ten years old and he died on October thirty first on Halloween, I was like a little taken aback by that. So he came to me and he said, "Michelle, I've come to say goodbye. I have um, I have a lot of work to do. I, I can't get stuck in the astral plane." So please don't hold me back from the work I need to do. Mm. And I said, I'm, I'm not here to hold you back. I definitely needed to hear you say goodbye. And, uh, and I said, I love you. And he goes, I love you. And I'll always be with you. And I let him go. And then astral plane at the age of 10, it's like, what, what are we talking about? (laughs) Right. You know, and that's and that's not in the spelling words or vocab words for the week. And so, and so I, you know, when I went into my parapsychology classes in college, you know, the astral plane came in. I'm like, oh my goodness. And it's like the way that I see it isn't even the way that they perceive it to be. Because I think that if we're involved in the astral plane, if we're caught in the astral plane, either we didn't complete something or, or something or someone is holding us back from moving into a, another realm of whatever the, the, mm-hmm. the possibilities are. So, um, you know, with David, I never, I, I, I never, he never came to say goodbye to me. He never, I never felt that, 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 that essence of him ever leaving. Um, and so, you know, anybody could, any psychics or mediums can say, you know, what they see, like, oh, I feel him. I see him behind you and things like that. That does not help me in my grief. Mm-hmm. personally mm-hmm. but uh, if he had something to say to me that was really funny that someone could say hey he just said ha 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 I would be happy to hear that that would make mm-hmm. me happy but not to say he's here because I'd rather him not be here I'd rather him being of service elsewhere in other realms of wherever he has to be um, and not get caught up here um, unless that that's his contract you know mm-hmm. so so, um, you know, he didn't take care of his paperwork. He never um, fo- followed through with, um, you know, cleaning up his beneficiary information, his advanced health care directive. None of those things were done. And, um, and, and the, the, the painful part of that is that, you know, when, when funds were coming in, you know, they went directly to one person without that person providing for the family, the, mm-hmm. the entire family, like the mother, right? Mm-hmm. My, my mother. So, so it's, um, it's interesting how things, you know, gr- grieving or not being able to continue to grieve or, you know, the, here, here's grieving A, right? And now we're grieving T and, and, and how do you envelop all these emotions that are gathered up from different pieces to, to, to get to a point of moving forward. For me, it was share what I know, mm-hmm. become a deaf midwife, find, you know, do this work because I love it. I've, I sat at bedside and I know what it's like. And I, and it's, it's so for me, I just, I feel so at ease and in, uh, in my calling mm. and, and having the expo and sharing 
everybody else, all these professionals, all these individuals that have done so much work at end of life to be able to share what they've done, share their wares, their tools, their resources to the public. So we have these conferences, we have these symposiums, we have these summits for all these professionals to come together to talk about things. Oh, I learned this, I did this, here's my new tools, let's, let's work it out. But who needs that information is the public. And so the expo is all about ex giving all of this information above to the people that need to hear it and feel it and know it and prepare for it, not just have a conversation on a bench, but take, take that conversation, you know, write the checklist out on what you still need to do. Not a bucket list. I'm not talking about a bucket list. I'm talking about mm -hmm. a checklist of, of practicalities. Uh, You're talking practicalities, not like traveling to wherever. Right. Advanced healthcare directive. Mm -hmm. Learning learning about palliative care. Learn about the 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 the, the cycle of of walking into hospice. Uh, walking <laughs> that was interesting. Walking into hospice and and how is palliative care and hospice work together? And and uh, you know what what can we do with different types of grief and um, I, I look at it as a as a wave of emotion, and uh, and the, and and knowing it's coming. And so, what I've been teaching children is that you know when you're grieving, you know it, you know it, and you know it's coming because it builds, it builds, it builds. So how do you want to how do you want to work through this? Are you you know are you a is this a seven wave formation that you're feeling? Is this a tidal wave? Is it a tsunami where it's just building, building, building till it's just an explosion of? And so what I do is I share visions of, uh, well, are you a whale? Uh, do you want to be a mermaid going through this? Do you want to be a dolphin? So when you're doing those seven wave formations and you're jumping out, you can take that breath because you know you're going back in again. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be on a surfboard or a cello, cello surf, what are they called? The um the sails on the surfboards. Yeah, I, what are they called? I know what they're para, para uh, surfers. Yes, something yes. like that. And, you know, yes. be be that, and um and and there's different ways of of looking at that because if you are going to be that surfer coming back to the shore, you know, to look back at the ocean again and know that you are you know you're in a safe place and that the the grief that came up is only to share with you the joy of living. Mm hmm. Mm. I love that. The grief that comes shares with you the joy of living. So we are partnering for this. I'm I'm coming on board. I'm going to be uh, doing a session on grieving and believing. I love and it. I'm really excited about it. Yes. So I finally made a decision with your pushing as to what I should do. But can you share with everybody today if they're interested in learning more where they can go and find out it will be in my show notes, but just let people know, you know, what, what the different options will be to learn about at this expo and where they can learn about it. Okay. Thank you, Amy. So we've got the beautiful dying expo.com beautiful dying expo.com. So if you go to beautiful dying.com, you're going to come to my uh, death midwifery company. Uh, so go to the expo and, um, and, we are, uh, it'll be November 13th, 14th, and 15th, starting at 10 o'clock in the morning and ending around 6.30 in the evening. Um, uh, coming to the trade show floor, it's all virtual. You would um, go ahead and just um, register at our platform, which is HopIn, H-O-P-I-N, and that information will be shared as well. And um, it's also on the uh, website where you click on tickets and you'll be able to go to all the different uh, ways to participate. So if you're coming to just check it out and see the trade show floor and um, and come to our morning and afternoon ceremonies where you'll find keynotes and music, that's all free to attend. And um, and that's, I mean, that's pretty amazing that work. We also have panels and workshops where Amy's going to be. And uh, that right now is at $199 for the entire weekend. So it's probably about $20 or less of workshop and or panel. Mm 
Our panels are mostly 90 minutes long. Um, all the workshops are an hour long. We have a whole grief support system uh, through our grief sanctuary as well as grief workshops that are going to be going on also all weekend long. Um, I'm really excited about this because we've, um, it's not just a piece of the end of our lives, but it's everything between now and then and then after. And so we've got an opportunity to learn about, you know, mindful hypnosis at end of life. We'll learn more about psilocybin therapy at the end of life. We're going to talk about social security. We're going to have a whole deal on social security uh, through life's journey, um, financial estate planning. So we've got a bunch of information, resources, tools, and we're looking at uh, gifting for those that uh, come to the um, the expo to see the panels and the presentations. The first, I'm I'm thinking like the first 100 people who sign up will receive a gift from any one of us, the exhibitors or presenters, as a gift to to them for signing up. And because uh, it's a, it's hard. It this this whole conversation and how I'm taking it to a, you know a plan of action is hard for people and not wanting to really look in there. Um, but now's the time. I mean, we've had this whole year, uh, I call it the year of reflection and conflict. And, uh, you know, coming in after the election, the American election, uh, I think it's perfect timing for this event to happen. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm so happy to be able to provide it. It is a nonprofit, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, and so there are opportunities for tax write-offs for the for you coming to us, and uh, we just we, whatever your needs are, we have we have uh, the therapists and the psychologists and the doctors and the nurses, and uh, uh, grief grief consultants and to to help us through. So please come and see and participate and and plan. Um, so yeah, and um, I will have all this information posted in my show notes so people can take a look and see what you're going to be offering. This is obviously going to air before the the event, right before the event. So head on over buy your tickets. If you just want to do, it sounds like there's going to be opportunities just to sort of peruse, even if you didn't want to buy a ticket. Um, if you do want to hear my talk, you will need a ticket because I'm going to be doing, I think, a panel and a workshop. Um, but excited to share this with everybody. It's such a great resource for people. And I think that typically there's only like one aspect of death that gets covered, right? It's like estate planning or end of life planning or um, grieving. And this really seems to kind of nail everything. It does. So I, let me see. I've got this. So there are six tracks. And in the six tracks, there's financial estate planning, advanced care planning, end of life care, after death events holistic alternatives, and grief support, which will have the grief sanctuary included in it. So we're, we're, uh, we're ready for you. And we're ready to help and plan. And we'll sit on the bench. We'll have a conversation. Where is it you need to be? And then walk in and see what's available. Um, well, thank you, Michelle, so much today for sharing your story and for putting together an incredible resource for people. I know that it will benefit so many. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for this time. Uh, I'm talking about my brother. Of course. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Wondering what comes next and what it all means? Head over to Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. Also, if you could take a minute to rate and review my podcast, I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned as we continue to explore life, death, and the space between. <laughs>